standing. Come on, we invite you to worship with us on this morning. Come on, anybody glad to be in the house? Hallelujah. Come on, I don't know about you, but I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, we just thank the
Hallelujah. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear their love and be blessed. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto me and were light, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord is kept grown about them that knew him and delivered them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. I read for your consideration Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8. May God add a blessing to the readers' ears and the doors of his holy word. Dear Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, God. Father, we come before you, God, just to celebrate you on today, oh God. Father, we thank you on this day, oh God. We thank you for waking us up this morning, God, starting us on our way, God. God, we thank you for the activities of our men, oh God. God, we thank you, God, for having a sound mind on this morning, oh God. God, we just thank you, oh God. If we had 2,000 times, God, we would build up the say thank you, oh God. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God. Just for who you are, oh God. Who you allow us to be, oh God. God, we ask that you would have your way in this service, oh God. In the mighty name of Jesus, oh God. God, we thank you, God, for allowing us to see on today, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to hear on today, oh God. God, we thank you, oh God. We come to give you all the praise, God. All of the glory, God. All of the honor.
is an awesome, righteous God. We are just so excited to have choir members all the way from Mississippi. I have my family here and they are going to come and do a selection. Jesus, would you please come on there?
preacher for the hour. So that means I got an hour. All right, 
Amen goes right there. Amen, amen, hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Jonah chapter 3, verse number 10. Jonah chapter 3, verse number 10. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Jonah chapter 3, verse number 10, found in the Old Testament. When you found it, you will discover these words. Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. I want to talk about when God changes his mind. When God changes his mind. We began this series on last week. We talked about God's plan, man's soul. And when we look at the book of Jonah, we find that God has given Jonah an assignment. Jonah wasn't dumb. Jonah understood very well the assignment. Jonah wasn't confused. Jonah understood that God was saying to him to go to Nineveh. And when you go to Nineveh, whatever you do, make sure that you preach to the Ninevites and tell them to change their ways. But Jonah did not go. Jonah decided that he would take a retreat. He decided that he would do an escape mechanism. Jonah decided that he would leave the path of God and go to his own path and his own plan. Well, you know the story. Jonah, Jonah went down to Joppa. Jonah went down into the ship. Jonah went down into the hull of the ship. And Jonah went down into the storm. It says to us that the word of God will come unto you and God is speaking to you. Even in the 21st century, God has much to say to you, about you, and for you. The word of God it's speaking to you. But here it is, Jonah decides to go away from the presence of God. Well, I said to you last week that whenever you go from the presence of God, you find yourself in a downward spiral. When you leave God's presence, you will go down to another city. You will go down to the harbor. You will go down to the ship. And you will go down into the hub of the ship. And your life is on a downward stop. If you won't testify today, let me testify that I walked away from the presence of God. And every single time I decided that I was smart enough. That I knew enough. And that I was experienced enough. To leave the presence of God, I went down. And that downward spiral became a disaster. All right. Said to you last week that even though we serve an awesomely loving God, this God has wrath in his hand. This God has a wrath of correction for us. Whenever we're disobedient to God, God knows how to speak to the storms, the winds, and the waves. And for some of us, it takes two, three, four, five, six storms. For some of us, it takes six, seven, eight years. But God knows how to get your attention when you won't give him your attention. Such it was with Jonah. Jonah left the presence of God, disobeyed the word of God, and Jonah found himself in the wrath of God. Jonah was on a ship, sleep. Now, don't, don't confuse this sleep that Jonah was taking for a belief that God is going to save him. It wasn't that he was walking in faith. As a matter of fact, he was walking without faith. 
he was asleep on the ship and the winds and the waves were clouding. The captain of the ship went down and said, man, what's wrong with you? Where are you from? What's your occupation? What's your name? What have you been doing? And we up here fighting with these winds and the waves and you're down here sleeping. It says to us today that some of your friends, your family members, are asleep at the helm. That's right. They are asleep on the job. Yeah. I said to you last week that the Proverbs writer said, just a little folding of your hands, just a little slumber and sleep, and then poverty will reach out and grab you like an armed man. Yeah. I said to you last week that any boy at 10 years and up, uh, they should not be hiring a yard man to mow the yard. Yeah. <laughs> they, they need to work. They need to find something to do. The idle mind is the devil's workshop. Said to you last week that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of righteousness. Whenever you feel God, when they began to feel God, when they began to see the waves and began to see the sea rise up like a monster. They began to question each other. What have you done? Why is this sea like this? This sea has never been like this before. And some of us are saying in the 21st century, it has never been this hot before anywhere. It has never been like this before. And what have we done to mess up the situation? When we're in trouble, we need to call on Yahweh God, the creator God. Jonah says, I serve the most high God, Yahweh, God. I serve the God that created the sea and the way. Yeah. He says, throw me off the board. Throw me off the ship. Throw me overboard. And if you throw me overboard, then the sea will settle down. Right. They threw him overboard. And my last point to you last week that there's God's grace even when we mess up. They threw him overboard. God dispatched a, a, a fish to swallow up Jonah. It was grace because the, the fish didn't chew. It was grace because the fish didn't run off with him and take him way off somewhere. It was a grace because the chemicals that comes inside his mouth did not kill Jonah. God gave Jonah another chance. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but you need another chance. God has given you one more chance. He has awakened you one more time. He has given you another chance to get it right with him. That's God's grace. Unmerited favor. Not that we're so holy. Not that we're so good that we deserve where we are. It's only because of God's amazing grace that we are where we are, doing what we do with the set of minds that we have. I say to you very often, you need to remember that it's because of God's grace that we are in our right mind. That's right. Thank Even you. though some of us may be tripolar, we are still in our right mind. Right. And it takes God to keep us yeah. in our right mind. It, no one can keep you in your mind. Your degrees can't keep you there. Your professor can't keep you there. Your mom and your daddy can't keep you there. It takes the almighty God, the God creator, Yahweh God, who created the mind, who created the body. It takes that God to keep us in our right mind. We pick up this week. We pick up this week in chapters 2 and chapters 3. And we look at chapters 2 and chapter 3. When we close out chapter 1, Jonah is praying. I want to start by saying today that God answers your prayers. You ought to pray. You ought to pray. My first point to you is that God is waiting on you to pray. God is looking for you to call on him. You are not too bad to pray. You haven't gone too far to pray. You need to call on God. I oftentimes say that prayer and evangelism are the one, two, the one and two things that are neglected in the local church. All right, all right. If we call for activities, everybody's here. If we call for things in the community, everybody's present. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to prayer, yeah. 
Well, you know, I don't pray out in the opening. No, you know, I, the Bible says that you go into your secret closet and, and you get into your secret closet and after you close the door, then you call on the God that is in the secret closet and the God that's in secret will reward you openly. That is correct. But what if you don't get to the closet? What if you don't get to the deep secrets of your mind and your heart? You know he is talking about your heart. He's not talking about the door at your house. He's not talking about the closet that you go in at your house. He's talking about your mindset. He's talking about your heart. What if you don't have time to get your heart right? What if you're in the public and you don't know how to pray in the public? Yeah, they asked me to pray in Fort Bend County and they said, whatever you do, don't pray in Jesus' name. Whatever you do, don't pray in Jesus' name. I said, well, you do want me to pray, right? Yes, we want you to pray. I said, you asking me to pray, why? He said, well, because we know you can get a prayer through. I said, well, the only way for me to get a prayer through is that I pray in the name of Jesus. He said, well, let me just tell you, we don't want you to pray in the name of Jesus. What they were really saying, Brother Miles, is we want you to pray for shape, form, and fashion. We want you to pray because we need to put somebody in this slot, and we think that you can pray a pretty prayer. So they and they told me, yes, we want you to pray. I said, okay. I knew I wasn't going back anyway. I knew it was my last, my last opportunity anyhow. I knew I had an opportunity to represent Jesus in the midst of the public school system. I knew I had this last opportunity anyway. Yeah. So I began to pray. I said, Lord, it's in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Jesus that's your only begotten son. God is in the name of Jesus, the Christ. The one who died on a skull hill called Calvary. Lord, it's in the name of Jesus, the one they buried in a borrowed tomb. Lord, it's in the name of Jesus, the Jesus that rose early that third day morning. God, I call on you today in behalf of these athletes. I'm calling in the name of Jesus. God, I ask you to not get, let them get injured. I'm asking in the name of Jesus. Lord, I ask you to protect both sides, sides A and side B. I pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who died on Calvary, buried in a barber tomb, in the name of Jesus, the one who rose early that third day morning. Lord, I'm asking you to come into the stadium right now in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I ask you to bless these vassalies in the name of Jesus. Amen. We need to understand that we have no power without the name of Jesus. We have no prayer without the name of Jesus. We have no composure without the name of Jesus. We have no Christianity without the name of Jesus. We can't get to our prayers to heaven without the name of Jesus. We cannot confront God without the name of Jesus. When we look at the text, we find that he's praying. He's calling on God. God, I messed up. And when we look at the next slide, the two of viewing, when we look at the next slide, we see our very first point. The very first point that says that we have come to a point where we need to recognize God. Recognize who God is and what God has already done for us. Yes. When God changes his mind, God is not finished with you yet. Jonah got kicked overboard. Jonah got pushed overboard. Jonah moved overboard. Jonah volunteered to jump overboard. They threw Jonah overboard. After they had thrown all their stuff overboard, they finally got the right thing. But because you're overboard today, doesn't mean that God has finished with you yet. All right, all right, all right. God is not through with you yet. God still want to use you. God still want to bless you. God want to use you to bless somebody else. Right, so he prays. God is not finished with you yet. He's not finished with you yet. He says that 
the text says that, that Jonah began to tell God what God had done for him. That's why Jesus says when you pray, you need to pray like this. You need to give honor to God first. He says when you pray, you say, our Father which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Glory to your name. God, we bless you. We honor you. And that's why we pray. When we pray, we want to thank God for who he is before we ask him for anything. Jonah begins to pray. And when Jonah begins to pray, he realizes at that point that God is not through with him yet. Have you gotten to a point in your life? Well, life has just gone bonkers on you. Life has shut down on you. Life has moved aside on you. It looks like you got bad blood everywhere you go. People don't want to be around you. you. They move like you hadn't taken a shower. They move away from you as if you have got some leprosy or something. It's because life is closing in on us. The way of the transgressor is hard. The way of the transgressor is hard. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short. All of us have messed up. In the midst of messing up, sometimes your self-esteem will leave you. When you know you didn't make the right decision. When folk remind you that you didn't make the right decision. And let me tell you, you don't have to. You don't have to remind yourself that you haven't made the right decision. Your family members will remind you your, your friends, so-called, will remind you, and they will tell you, I remember when. I remember when, but you have to remind them, it's not now what I used to be, and I'm not going to be what I'm going to be, because God is blessing me. And the last time you saw me broke, busted, and disgusted, it was the last time, because now I know Jesus. And once a man Woman, boy, girl gets to know Jesus. Their lives will be changed. They will never be the same. So my first point is, God is not through with you yet. My second point is the fact that God is still in control of you. God is still working on you. God is still moving on your behalf. God is still moving in such a way that you understand that God is still dealing with you. You got to hear the word of God. And when we move to my second point, I want you to understand that God is still doing some things. And as God is doing some things, he has honor for your prayers. God honors your prayers. When, when Jonah prays, God hears him. And God honors him. God hears your prayers. Don't think he doesn't hear you. God hears you. You just keep on praying. I know, I know some preachers will tell you, you take it to the Lord and you leave it there. And I believe you ought to take it to the Lord and leave it there, but you ought to keep on knocking on the door with it every chance you get. The angels in heaven ought to stay busy because you're still calling on God. Yeah, you ought to take it to the Lord and leave it there. That just means that you ought to take it out of your hands and put it in God's hand. But if it's in God's hand, you got to make sure that you keep talking to God. Now, you don't have to remind God. You don't have to keep telling God. God heard you the first time. But when you keep on telling him, it creates a fellowship between you and God. And sometimes you don't even have to remind him. Sometimes you don't even have to tell him. God is right there already waiting on you. He's there. And that's why God blesses us without us asking sometimes. And then sometimes we ask and we keep asking. God is an all-seeing God. He knows what we need. We know what we want. But God knows what we need. And God hears our prayers and God honors our prayers. And because he's God, he knows everything. And as I move to my third point, I want you to understand that because God hears your prayers. And because God honors your prayers, God will always bless through his word. We, we need the word. That's why we're listening to the word. That's why we're studying the word. Because God will bless you through his word. God honors his word. 
One of the best things, one of the best things, one of the very best thing a parent want to hear is their child repeating the words that they have told them. I mean, things just get so joyous when you hear a child repeating what you have told them. And you can hear a child at an early age, even a child on milk, saying the things that you told them and they are reciting it back to somebody else. God blesses us through his word. That's why we read his word. That's why we study his word. That's why we listen to his word. I dare you to try to put a poster around your house in every room of what you want God to do. But when you ask God to do something, you need to support it with your word. Years ago, years ago, we wanted to go on mission trip. Years ago, God showed me that we were missionaries called to do his will and his work. At that time, we posted the J-Bass prayer in every single room. J-Bass said, J-Bass was ugly. I'm telling you, I want to stop by and tell you, even if the folks say you're ugly, you ought to be on target with God. Jabez was ugly. Jabez was one that they didn't deal with. Jabez was, was named Jabez because Jabez wasn't worth dealing with. But the Bible says Jabez called on God. Jabez prayed unto God. Jabez was anointed in his prayer unto God, and he asked Jay, he asked God to bless me indeed. Somebody need a blessing indeed. God, I need you to bless me right now. I need you to bless me indeed. God, I'm calling on you. Jabez had a heart that was turned toward God. And it says that God granted him and broadened and widened his territory. He took him places that he didn't even think about. It took him places that he didn't even know about. Now, if you, you know, let me just share with you some of you. One brother that Pastor Grimes and I are familiar with, he had not left third ward until he was 26 years old. I didn't say he hadn't left Houston. This brother hadn't left third ward until he was 26 years old. And he only left then because he got married and his wife pulled him out of third world. Let me say to young people, there are more places that God want to take you other than Houston, Missouri City, Bel Air, and Pearland. God wants to broaden your horizon. He wants to expand your glow. God wants to take you somewhere and do some things with you that no one in your family has ever done. And he has chosen you to get it done. God will bless you if you stay in his word. You got to stay in his word. If you walk with him in his word, God will bless you through his word. But you got to stay on, stay in his word. Every day you got to eat his word. Every day you got to eat his word. So we post this J-Man's prayer throughout every room, every restroom, every closet, and we, we put it in different uh, versions of the Bible. New American Standard here. Christian Standard Bible here. King James here, New King James here. Every room had a different version of the Bible because we wanted God to expand our territory. Within the next year, we found ourselves in the midst of Brazil, Brasilia, Brazil, the capital of Brazil. And we were sharing, sharing the word of God because when God blesses you through the word, you ought to be willing to share his word. And we were sharing his word through an interpreter. And whatever I said, he said it. And whatever I did, he did. One day we were, we were in the middle of, of, of preaching and there was an interpreter with me. They flew in an interpreter that was just my size. And we had been together for three days. And on the fourth day, he shows up with a blue suit on with a slacks and vest. I showed up with a white shirt, blue suit on, just the slacks and the vest. Because God had, had knitted our hearts together. One day I took off the running. Sometime I can get animated. I took off the running to the right. He took off the running to the left. And by the time I end my sins, we back at the pulpit and to put them together. Because the word was going forth. God wants to bless you through his word. God is speaking to you through his 
word. God is ministering to you through his word. God had gotten to a point where he was sick and tired of being sick and tired of this hegel, hegelistic nation called Nineveh, town called Nineveh. God was tired of it. God, God wanted the men of God to share his word. As I move to my fourth point, you need to understand that God wants you to understand his word and then he wants you to totally surrender to him. God wants total surrender. God wants you to totally surrender to him. When we look at the text in chapter 3, we find out not only did the king hear the word of God, the people heard the word of God. I told you on last week, it's a sad day when the preacher preaches prosperity and he's the only one prospering. It's a sad day when the preacher preaches prosperity and everybody around him are unpopular. You got to be prosperous. You have to make sure you do what you want to do. You buy what you want to buy. Go where you want to go. But what you need to do first, create a budget. And at the top of your budget, make sure tithes and offerings are written down. The reason why people are stuck in poverty is because they have a poverty mentality. Givers get given to. I think I said that two more times. Givers get given to. It's bad English, but I gotta say it one more time. I'm gonna end this sentence with a preposition and you can figure it out. Givers get given to. If you are a giver, God can bless you. I always give this analogy. If you, if you put powder, you put powder on. Uh, something in your hand, if you put flour in your hand and close it up and you hold it real tight, you got you got it in there, you put it on a bucket of water, a running water, you put it there and you hold that fist tight and you don't let anything get out, but you can't let anything get in. When you pull it out from under the water and you open up, you still got some of that powder, but I guarantee you some of it fell out, but you couldn't get any blessings in. So if you do not become a giver, you will either be stuck in poverty or poverty will arrest you. Givers get given to you. People just walk by, walk by and just, just give you stuff just because you are a giver. They don't even have to know you just, just because you are a giver. I tell the story about my $15 tithes. When I was in my early 22s and and Brother Miles would see me walking Sunday school class. I was just to the nine, according to me. I had my $12 ties and my $15 ties. Randy Towns came off the street and joined the church, and he didn't have a tie. I took three of my brand new ties that had not been worn, and I gave them to Randy Town. I mean, these were my best ties. These weren't $12 ties. These were some $15 ties. I mean, these are my pride and joy ties. I mean, these were 15 whole dollars. I had to rape and straight to get these three ties. $15 ties. $15 ties. I gave three of them to Randy Town. And I gave it just out of a good heart. God wants you to totally surrender. Totally surrender. I gave it out of my heart. Didn't expect anything in return. Pastor Stern says it like this, and I may mess it up. Sister Davis can correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. Pastor, Pastor Charles Stern, Stern of one New Hope Church in one Texas says, he says to us, even today, Pastor Stern says to us that mission is what you do for other folk, not expecting anything else in return. We have to get to a point in our lives where we're willing to do something for other folk and not expect anything else in return. Gave Randy Towns my, my expensive tie. Brother Carl Dale, my expensive set. Still in the box. Not many days later, Deacon Johnny Foster walks up to me. Brother Miles and Pastor Graham know that Deacon Johnny Foster have real ties. And he wants you to know they are real ties. He walks up to me. He knew nothing about the ties that I had given away. But he walks up to me. And he gave me three boxes. And in those three boxes, there are ties. 
I gave away my $15 tithes, not many hours, not many days later, Johnny Foster walks up to me and slips three tithes still in the box in my hand. And because we all know Johnny Foster, he still had the tags on the box. And I started looking at the box because I wanted to know if God was really going to give me an increase or God just going to return what I gave. Let me just serve notice on you. God will never give you back what you have given. He will always multiply. I didn't say that. He will always multiply what you have given. Yeah. Yeah. Gave away $15 tithes. Gave away three of them. He brings me three tithes still in the box. And I looked on the back side of it and had some name I couldn't even pronounce on it. And you know, when you can't pronounce it, you know it's pretty good. And it, it had some other stuff, some descriptions on it. It didn't say polyester. It didn't say cotton. It had some name, some fabric I couldn't name. And when I flipped the box open, when I flipped the box over, it said $50 a tie. $45 a tie. $48 a tie. God has a way of increasing for us as we give unto others and don't expect anything in return. And that's why folk who always talk and praise it say, oh, everybody can't do it. It's because you're not a giver. No, everybody can't do it because God can't give to a closed hand. He gives to an open hand. God wants us to totally surrender unto him. Trust him. Just few days, few, few, I guess two weeks ago, Sister Brown stood here and gave her testimony of how tithing was, was a great thing for her and how she never went, been without one. Well, I'm not surprised about it simply because I know that God will keep his promise. If you totally surrender unto him, if you totally give your whole self to him, you need to understand that God will bless you beyond measure if you totally surrender unto him. Well, why are you talking about tithes? I'm talking about tithes because some people get saved in their dress code, but they don't get saved in their pocketbook. I said some people get saved in their dress code. Some people get saved in their mouths. Some people get saved in where they used to go, but they never get saved in their pocketbooks and purses. When you totally surrender unto God, the Bible says, Jonah totally surrendered unto him. He began to pray and tell God, God, you kept me when I was in danger. God, you walked with me when I was in danger. God, I went down into the fish. I went down into the sea. But God, you kept your hands on me. And for that, God, I say thank you. We need to understand that God has given us mercy. Yes, sir. It's not because you've been so saved so long. It's not because you've been so good to other people. It's not because you've been, been attending church. Because if folk just attending church would get them there, we'll have a house full. It's only because of God's grace and God's mercy that we even still exist. And that's why we come in the church to, to raise our hands. We come in the church to do our dance. We come in the church to get things done simply because we want to honor the one who has blessed us all week long. Yeah. All right. You ought not be able to keep it to yourself. Yeah. You ought to run and tell somebody, he changed me. He made me over. He made me me. And as I move to my final point, number five. I want you to know that you need to totally surrender unto God because God grants mercy. Now here it is, these Ninevites, I'm at the end of chapter 3 now. These Ninevites, they changed their hearts. They changed their minds. And when they changed their hearts and changed their minds, they got to a point where they turned toward God. In the 70s and the 80s, we used to tell children, uh, say no to dope. Say no to drugs. We used to tell them, just say no. The problem with that slogan is we were not telling them what to say yes to. We need to tell them to say yes to Jesus. We need to tell them, as you move from one point to the other, as you grow from one point to the other, you need to get to a point in your life where you can say yes to Jesus. Say yes, Jesus. Jesus, yes, I surrender unto you. Jesus, yes, I'm here for you. Jesus, make me a servant. Bless me as I go forward. Jesus, yes. The king, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, the people sitting in sackcloth and ashes. 
the king steps down off of his throne. I just want to tell you that the God we serve is greater than any king that exists. Matter of fact, he is the king of kings. He is every king must humble themselves below the banner of Jesus Christ before Yahweh God. Every king must come down off his throne. The reason why some of us can't get blessed is because we still high and mighty and powerful and we do things and we can tell people to go here and they can go. We can tell people to do this and they will do it. But when you come down off your high horse, the Bible says, when my people come down off their high horse, when my people humble themselves, when my people pray, then I will hear from heaven and then I will forgive them of their sin. The king, the people, the king and the people find themselves in a fast. When we fast, when we fast, we ought to get to a point where we want to hear from God more than we want to hear from food. I said we want to hear from God more than we hear from food. Because we know that God can do more for us than food ever will. We want to push some things aside. And don't just go get stuff to fast from that you already know you have conquered. You need to fast from some things that, that you like. After next week, I'm going to be fasting from chocolate. I said after next week. I'm going to be fasting from chocolate. And, and the reason why I can fast from chocolate and call it a fast, Sister Richard, is simply because if you want to give me something, give me some chocolate. It's not because, it's not because I'm going to give this up because I don't deal with that. You need to fast from something you like. And it's something that gets you through the day. Some people need to fast from, from soda water. Some people need to fast from coffee. Because people have cranky attitudes when they don't have their first dip or first spoon of coffee every morning. You need to fast from something that you depended on and let God know, I'm dependent on you, Lord. I'm not dependent on it. Then people get to the point, oh, I got a headache doing my fast. That's how it's supposed to work. Oh, my stomach. Yeah, if you don't put anything in your stomach, your head and your stomach hurt. Oh, I'm weak. If you don't put anything in your body, your, your weakness will come. But you're depending on God to lift you physically, lift you spiritually. That's why the king and the people began to fast. And when they began to fast, they heard from heaven. The reason why they were fasting is because they messed up. Anybody in the room have messed up just one time? It, 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 have you just messed up one time when, when you thought you were smart and you thought you were going to get away with it? Let me tell you, God is waiting to hear from you because God will grant you mercy in the midst of it. After God heard from them through prayer and fasting, the Bible says God relented. King James would say God repented. The new King James said that he relented. And what I'm saying to you, God changed his mind. You remember, you, you remember Hezekiah, don't you? He was going to die. But he changed God's mind when he turned his head to the wall and said, Lord, give me another chance. I don't ask God for a second chance. I bypass that at age zero. I want another chance because God's mercy will give us another chance. We need another chance. We need God to grant us mercy because we don't deserve mercy. We don't deserve to live. We don't deserve to be here. God is in the ability. He is in the position. He is able to grant us mercy. So these Ninevites confessed their sins. They, they repented of their sins. They changed their hearts. They changed their minds. And God granted them mercy. If you read the whole whole book of Jonah, you see what God is going to take them out if they don't hear the word. All right. But the Bible said they, they did what God expected and needed for them to do, and God changed his mind. Verse number 10 says, then God saw their works. Don't get this works confused with works in order to be saved. Because he goes on to explain what these works are. The works were that they turn away from their evil ways. Some people just evil. Some people just trifling. Some people just sinful. 
And they're going to continue to be it until they turn away from their evil ways and turn to God. The Bible says they turn away from their works, turn away from what they were doing, turn away from their evil ways, and God relented from the disaster. God was going to bring a disaster upon them. And he had to bring upon them this disaster because of their sins. And God chose not to do it. God has a way of blessing us in spite of us. In spite of our evil ways, in spite of our conditions, in spite of what we go through, God has a way to bless us. And he will do it through his mercy. This is not the first time that God has done this. He did it over 2,000 years ago. The world was in a mess. Sin was all about us. Men were doing their own thing, their own way. And men had come to the conclusion that they were smarter than God is. And men were trying to do things their own way and they were successful in it. But oh, they were on their way to hell. But Jesus came. God pleaded the blood of Jesus on them. God allowed Jesus to die over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. Yeah, yeah they nailed him tight. Yeah, they, they ribbed his feet. Yeah, they nailed his hand. Yes, they hung him high. They stretched him wide. They dropped him low. Jesus died on Calvary for your sins and my sins. They died. He died until the earth reeled and rocked like a drunken man. He died until the S U in to refuse to shine. He died until the moon dripped down with blocks of blood. He died on Calvary that day until one centurion soldier said, surely this must be the Son of God. He died in until it became midnight at midday. He died on Calvary. They took him off the cross, laid him in a bottle tomb. It was a bottle tomb, I tell you. It was a bottle tomb because he didn't need it too long. It was a bottle tomb because he was going to give Joseph his brand new tomb back. Out of that Thursday morning. Out of that Thursday morning. Yes, early he got up with all power. He got up with all power. And heaven and earth in his hands. He rose from the dead. Out of that third day morning. And now he sits on the right hand of the Father. Making intercession for you and me. And every time we confess our sins. He said, Lord, give him another chance. One of these old days. At the top of God. One of these old days. When, the blood, when we are walking around on earth. He has nothing else to accomplish. Before he comes back. One of these old days. At the top of God. The dead in Christ shall rise. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in the air. And we will forever be with the Lord. It's not because we deserve it. It's because God has granted us mercy and grace. One more time. Hallelujah to the Lord. I may not sing down here. But when I get over there, I'm going to sing us to the heavenly choir. And I'm going to sing unto the Lamb. That was slain before the foundation of the world. Hallelujah to the Lord. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Yahweh God. He is the creator. He's the maker. He's the creator of all things. Hallelujah. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You are to come to Jesus. Come just as you are. Don't wait till you get it right. You'll never get it right. You need Jesus to help you get it right. If your life is in shambles, you need to try Jesus. If your life is going really well, you need to try Jesus. If you're on a rocky road or hills and valley, you need to try Jesus. This is your moment. This is your invitation. Come to Jesus. Just as you are. The door is open. You need to come to Jesus. You tried her. You tried him. You tried it. You tried them. Now try Jesus. Don't have to try Jesus. 
people of Nineveh had to try Jesus. And you need to try Jesus. God is not finished with you yet. He wants to use you. God will honor us and God will hear your prayers. The door is open. God will bless you if you're in His Word. He blesses us through our Word. God desires us to totally surrender unto Him. God desires total surrender. And God will grant you mercy and grace. I need mercy and I need grace. If you've never received Jesus as your personal Savior, this is your moment. Bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Just repeat these simple words after me and invite Christ into your life. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe now that you have prayed this prayer and honestly trust the story that you are now born again. We believe that you're on your way to heaven, but I say to you, join a good Bible teaching church. I recommend the New Beginning Church at 4251 Shermar Road, Houston, Texas, 77048. You can join globally or you can join locally. Please get in church. Please become a part of church. And please trust God to make things better for you. Yeah, it is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It is offering time. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand way up in the air and you will be served. If you need an envelope, raise, please raise your hand way in the air and you will be served. Please raise your hand and you will be served. Please raise your hand and you will be served. Great things. Great things. He has. God has made a way. He made a way. He has, he has, he will, he will give you the victory, victory, yes Lord, if you want to give electronically, you can do it by way of Zale. Our Zelle account is liftking.jesus at yahoo.com. Bring it down a little bit. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to mail in your gift, you can do so by mailing to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box. 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Father God, we thank you for money We thank you for income We thank you for increase We thank you for jobs We thank you, Father God, for benefits Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we come to give Bless us to give not grudgingly nor out of necessity Lord, we understand that you love cheerful givers In Jesus' name we pray Amen and thank God He has done great things Great things, great things. Relax your side to stand. Follow first impressions from the rear to the front. And bring forth the Lord's tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. He has, he has, he has. Anyway. He 
Yes. Now it's just time to stand. Follow the first request is from the rear to the front. Bring forth the Lord's tithes, often and sacrifices. Victory. Thank you, Father God, for another privilege to call upon you. Now, Lord, we ask to bless every person on our prayer list and those who are not included. We pray, Father God, that you minister to them. We pray that you give them hope. We pray that you encourage them. We pray, Father God, to bless them during this bereavement period. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to encourage them to know that you are God and you are not finished with them yet. Lord, we ask to lift every bow down here and give them strength and hope. Lord, bless Father God that they will trust you through all they're going through. And Lord, we ask you to heal, deliver, and strengthen as only you can. So in the precious, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. Amen. to everyone. I am here holding this really tall. <laughs> it's for a six foot man. <laughs> I am here to issue the certificates of completion for the second quarter of journaling and listening through the Bible. These that's a good place to uh, these members have completed, they have gone from Genesis all the way to Psalm 119. Okay, so they've already started on the third quarter. So, first of all, and it says, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 15, be diligent to present yourself to prove to God a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So we want to say congratulations to Katrina Winslow. Yeah. 
also your mouth. Come on down. Lane Irvin. Blanca Galvan. This is a milestone. That's right. Sophia Galvan. you here. If you're visiting for the very first time, if you're visiting for the first time, tell us your name and who invited you and who you have with you. Her name is Ruby Poss. She was invited here, here by Sister Davis, uh, Sister Gavan, and Sister Garza. She said Gavan, then she said Garza. And we're glad that you have come. Thank you so much for being here. Is there any other visitors with us today? We want to thank this group who've come to be, visit with us. Why don't you stand here? This is, this is our, our group from, uh, from Mississippi who has, has come to be a part of the Turning Hearts uh, Music Ensemble and the Turning Hearts Music Camp for this week. Amen. Among this group, we have uh, one of the contributing writers for Sharing the Gospel Good News on the Go. I'm going to ask her to come and say hello to you. Thank you. When you're mad, I like when you smile. <laughs> Hi. Hi. All right, so I wrote about uh, grief through evangelism. Um, and basically, I kind of sum up what I've been through. Um, because seven years ago, I lost my husband and my two children in a train accident. So I want to encourage, or I believe that my God given purpose is to encourage other people to get through their grief journey. Um, and I do that through evangelizing because I go out and speak to others, telling my story, encouraging people to get through because you don't have to stay stuck where you are. It is possible to move forward because there is life after death. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. She has a powerful story and she's making a difference all over this world. Amen. Amen. Our, our next presenter and in, um, in contributing author is Pastor Grimes. Pastor Aaron Grimes, will you come and share your story? Hi. Good morning to the church. Good morning. I was blessed and privileged uh, by my brother and just to be able to contribute to a great work um, simply because it's just part of who we are and 
I contributed by writing about call-based evangelism. Uh, call-based evangelism is not about being called as a preacher. It's being called on what you've been commissioned by God to do. Amen. Through your walk, through what God has done through you. Paul spoke to the Ephesian church in Ephesians 4 and 1. He says, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And everyone who has received Jesus Christ as your Savior has been called. Yes, sir. And so it's about what you do and how you live your life, basically. And so God blessed a young man from Memphis uh, several years ago, um, almost 40 plus years now. Me and his brother have been in ministry, I mean, digging, walking, crawling in ministry for over 30 years. And my journey has gone from Memphis to Houston, Texas, and now in the DMV area, which is otherwise called the Maryland District of Columbia and uh, Virginia. And God has blessed me to, uh, you know, come from a very humble background of ministry and being used to do a lot of work and seeing ministry. But when you've been called and when you're walking in your calling and you're being obedient to the call that God, God will take you to immeasurable heights. And God has allowed me now to be pastor of a ministry that uh, hosts uh, 30 plus nationalities of people from all over the world. We have missionaries in multiple countries around the world. Um, God has just tremendously given me uh, an assignment that I just can't walk away from. And so when I see this and I see my sister Davis and my brother are doing, it just warms my heart because we have to be willing to sacrifice. We have to be willing to totally surrender as he preached earlier. And when you do that, God will take you on a journey that will just, as the kids would say, rock your boat. It's amazing. I am just totally adored by this ministry. I've been in prayer with them from the very beginning and to until now. And so I bring you greetings from First Alliance Church in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, we are, like you say, just a multicultural international church that hosts people from all over the world. And I just thank God. I, I thank God for everything. And so wherever I go, I try to uh, say uh, the goodness of Jesus, or not try, I give uh, the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for me. And so I'm just blessed by being a part of this uh, project of uh, evangelism, and uh, it's a great thing. God bless you all, and thank you. Pastor Grimes, what are was one of those bootleg preachers when he was a deacon. So, so as a deacon, he he was a bootleg preacher. So, and I think he still holds the record at the Holman Street Church for the youngest deacon to be ordained at the Holman Street Church. He was much younger then, um, but he holds the record of being the youngest deacon ever to be ordained. He's been serious about ministry even before that time. He and his wife are doing great things in the Maryland area. We want to thank him for, for coming by and be a part of us. Thank everybody who's visiting with us. All minds clear. Everything's good. All minds clear. Five o'clock. Five p.m. today. Five p.m. today. Brothers and sisters, we look to see you. Five p.m. today to rearrange everything for this week. Amen. Let us stand to be dismissed. Say it again. Let the church say it
Father God, for your mercy and your grace. Thank you that you're not finished with us yet. Thank you, Lord, that as we dig into your word, we will obey your word. Lord, we know you're still speaking, so we say, speak to us, Father, in the name of Jesus. Bless us as we go. Bless us as we go before others. And bless us to be living sacrifices for the world to see. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. Unto him, the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. You are Jesus.